Hello friends, and welcome to my new video, in which I will tell you some new, amazing stories. But before we begin, please subscribe to my channel and hit the like button on this video. Also, don't forget to write your thoughts about these stories down in the comments. Let's get started. Today's story is, Karen didn't realize that I worked here as an assistant manager. I'm a 23-year-old male. Have any of you had the strange experience of being a dedicated worker who does your best at work and is praised by your district and regional management, yet is utterly despised by your coworkers and store staff? When you replace someone at another location, everything is fine. But when you return, everything is terrible. Well, that was me when I worked at Starbucks. The events of this story take place about three weeks after I begin working at my new job. At the time, everything was going well. I was having some difficulty with the inventory aspect of things, but logistics and scheduling were great. Since I was still learning, I wasn't supposed to be left alone, but when the store manager had an issue and had to step away for a short while, I told her that I would handle it. I'm contentedly sitting in a small place with a couch and a beautiful view, drinking coffee and eating whatever has been spoiled, when suddenly... A streak of poorly done blonde colored hair invades my space and screeches. I'm sorry, you must leave this seat, youngster, as I must leave for a meeting. She was carrying a laptop. Oh, you should probably go upstairs because there's more plugs and there's a better reception there. I knew this for a fact. Move or I'll tell the manager that I'm a regular. I need this position. That made me raise an eyebrow. I'd never seen her before. So, M, you know, I'm sorry, but she's not here right now. In addition, I was merely attempting to assist you. However, if you believe you can manage, feel free to have a seat. I stood up and left. I headed to the back room to finish my rest, and a few minutes pass by when I suddenly hear a screech, and not five seconds later, the cashier pops her head in. Um, I'm sorry to trouble you, but can you handle this insane lady? The blonde who has dyed hair? Yeah, let's go. We head there, and it was in fact that Karen, screaming at the top of her lungs for a manager. I'm sorry, ma'am. As I previously informed you, manager isn't here right now. I'm handling her responsibilities until she returns. What's the issue? You? The director? Don't make me laugh. I'm going somewhere else. Well, Miss Manager is not present right now. She had to depart for personal reasons and will return in a... I'll have you fired for this because I couldn't connect to my reunion, and now you're acting in place of your boss. Where is she? Ma'am, I'm the assistant manager, and I warned you that the connection there was bad. Stop lying. I'll make sure you lose your job, new guy, when manager comes back. She huffed and puffed back into her corner, the customers on the queue all staring at us with confused expressions. After about an hour, the manager returns, looking exhausted. She apologized to us for rushing like crazy and was about to begin telling us what occurred when the Karen bursts back into the room. Manager, you wouldn't believe how that youngster threatened me when you finally arrived. You should terminate him. He insulted me and behaved as though he was in control and refused to permit me access to the Wi-Fi. Your deputy manager? Look, just because you're my mother's best friend doesn't give you the right to come here and threaten my staff in any way. Please exit the back room. At least I want a refund, because my coffee became cold while I was attempting to connect to the stupid Wi-Fi. Um, have I ever taught you how to give refunds? Accompany me. We headed over to the cashier, and manager shows me through the steps. She had already done it in the past. Guess she was just making sure I remembered. But then I got an idea. Sorry to interrupt, manager, but... Despite my warnings that the location's reception was terrible and the Karen's decision to stay there despite that, not to mention the commotion she later created, I don't believe she's entitled to a refund. I would never raise my voice, so that is a lie. Do you agree, cashier? While still keeping her eyes firmly fixed on the coffee she was brewing, the pro barista stoner girl made the most incredible yet collected allegation. I mean... She's wild. She screamed for around 10 minutes and even injured my ears. Man, if you had heard her delivery, I can't even properly replicate that for you. 
I'm afraid I can't give you a refund. But, but, but... Sorry, Kay. See you later. She stormed off indignantly, furious, and ranting about the terrible customer service and how manager's mother would find out. I apologize. She's my mother's neighbor and has been causing trouble here ever since she learned that I'm the manager. After that, we all laughed, and the day continued as usual. However, another Karen had been stopped, and I should point out that this was a very small store, with an average of five people working the positions. It was also a very quiet location with a few office buildings, nothing out of the ordinary. I should also note that Starbucks leadership structures differ greatly depending on the country. Therefore, even though my contract stated assistant manager, I was not aware of that fact. In actuality, I served as more of a supervisor, and I'm no longer employed at Starbucks. After putting up with that foolishness for an entire year, I handed in my resignation. When one of the higher-ups called to ask why I was quitting, I explained to the poisonous workplace, and he made an offer to move me to another shop as an assistant manager. In all honesty, I despise the organization, but the compensation was excellent for an entry-level position. It was my first contract job, and it looked good on my resume, so I sold my soul for three whole years. It wasn't enjoyable, but after the terrible first year, the rest were pretty tolerable. It's so stupid to bother a person without even knowing who they are and what position they hold. It's especially stupid to prove to an assistant manager that he does not even work for the company or to threaten him with firing and threaten his own manager. I don't think somebody in a managerial position would make somebody they didn't trust or a bad person their assistant manager. I'm sure that even if this Karen had some real power and influence, the boss would have sided with his assistant. As it is, this Karen is just a neighbor of the manager's mother and would not even theoretically do anything bad. She would probably only make the boss's mother scold her adult daughter. The next story is Newly created elite HOA against our farm. For many years, we lived peacefully on my family farm without any conflicts with our neighbors, enjoying the beauty of our area every day. And this all continued right up until the moment I picked up the first ominous letter from the HOA from the mailbox. To fully understand our situation, you need to keep in mind that our farm was not part of any neighborhood and certainly not part of any homeowners association. We had been living there for generations, living a simple life, not bothering anyone, so no one bothered us in return. But something happened that we did not even expect. It started when a new elite residential complex grew up near our farm. These very wealthy people could not accept the fact that such poor people lived next door to them who could not morally or physically afford to destroy their family home for the sake of their new neighbors. They wanted us to live in their neighborhood, so we had to live up to the standards that they set. We had many conversations, but they could not accept our modest, albeit a bit shabby, farmhouse and the working fields around it. So their HOA arbitrarily expanded their jurisdiction over our farm, effectively making me and my family part of the HOA without our consent. They sent us a letter congratulating us for being part of their elite HOA. And then half a day later, they sent us two more letters saying that we were fined once for a rotten fence and once for working on our land and using farm equipment. After my analysis, I realized that they exceeded their authority many times over. They had no right to do almost everything that they did. My lawyer told me that we should go to court. In court, the HOA, realizing their mistake, tried to stop the trial and settle out of court. That's when I realized how much of a dead end I had driven them into. The judge ruled in my favor, not only rejecting all their counterclaims, but also awarding me a substantial compensation. The HOA was also ordered to pay my legal fees. Knowing that the HOA would retaliate, I turned to a reasonable number of my neighbors. Some neighbors who also had problems with the HOA sued them and won their cases quite easily, further depleting the HOA's cash reserves. 
Their reputation was already so tarnished that no one looked at them with any respect. In the end, the HOA was dissolved due to its insolvency and inability to enforce its rules. Finally, we were able to continue living in peace. The next story is, I created my own company to destroy my former boss's company. I had been running a landscaping business for nine years at the time, which was in 2008. Having been able to buy a home, pay off student loans, and establish a family, I had done reasonably well for myself. During the work season, which for us runs from March to November, I had four employees. From December to February, we primarily take a break and let our employees go. Aside, after the leaves are raked up from the autumn, there isn't much maintenance to be done in the Pacific Northwest, where our company concentrated primarily on upkeep. I'd gotten to know a home builder that year, and he asked me to take care of his own house because he was so pleased with our job. He requested that we begin the bid process for adding landscapes to the properties that he developed. Sounds simple, no? The homes this guy built weren't track homes or your typical cookie-cutter neighbors you find in the suburbs, so keep in mind that we focused primarily on upkeep and that my crew didn't have a lot of experience in the install aspect of landscape. No, he built homes ranging in size from 8,500 to 10,000 square feet with all the bells and whistles with the little home being 3,500 square feet on a 25,000 square foot lot. We started off with what I had assumed would be a fantastic partnership, because he was more generous with his landscape funds than many contractors I had met in the past. It was now the beginning of December, when my maintenance side of things started to wane, after we completed the first four jobs he gave us. This home builder approached me and asked if I wanted to continue having my maintenance team work for him throughout the winter. I inquired as to what he had in mind, because I knew that his upcoming home project wasn't scheduled to start until late January. He explained to me that he and his son had been testing spray foam insulation in their homes, and had made the decision to invest in equipment to launch their own business. The cost of the level's equipment was roughly $100,000. I promised to get back to him after speaking with the crew. The following week, five of us signed a contract to work with him for three months at a set wage rate. He believed that he had enough work to keep us occupied for the ensuing three months. The first task was insulating this amazing home for this plastic surgeon who spent no money sparingly on the appliances and materials he used in it. The Fort Lewis government buildings came next. New residential buildings came after that, etc., etc. Now, when I was insulating, this builder with whom I was friends was not my daily supervisor. Instead, it was his son, a jerk who is younger than I am. However, things looked to be going well, and we for the most part got along pretty well. Although the father was the owner of the insulation business, he rarely participated in day-to-day -day operations. For three months, hardly ever saw him. As a contractor myself, I was accustomed to not receiving a paycheck every two weeks like the majority of employees would. I received payment from my maintenance accounts once per month for the previous month's work, but it didn't all arrive at once. Occasionally, people fail to make timely payments. However, my team was accustomed to receiving payments on schedule, and I asked my new supervisor when to anticipate a check after my first month of employment ended without receiving one. I absolutely understand how that works, especially for a fledgling business trying to get off the ground. And he told me that once the checks started coming in, we would see our money. In order to maintain the peace on my end, I paid my guys. And my employer and I came to an understanding that I would keep account of all the payments and that he would write me a check as soon as he was able to. Additionally, I still owed the father over $10,000 on a landscape billing. But I wasn't too concerned because he wasn't always prompt with payments. Not that I had to bug him about it, but you get the idea. Now that February of 2009 is coming to a close, it was time to prepare for the upcoming season of landscape upkeep and put my crew back to work outside. From the latest landscaping project, or the insulation, still no money. As soon as I began calling the sun on a daily basis, when we stopped seeing each other as frequently, things turned ugly pretty quickly. I called the father, who largely just disregarded me. The son stopped returning my calls, texts, and so forth. The father never provided me with a direct response. Now mid-April 2009 is here. On their end, most communication has completely ceased. To ensure that the landscaping improvement was paid for, 
Before the house was sold, I filed a contractor's lien, which led to the father calling to invite me over for lunch and have a chat at his house. Based on our prior interactions, I assumed he would offer me some sort of bargain, so I agreed with meeting him. He basically informed me that he had been defrauded of money throughout the years by various people and that I would just have to accept it as a fact of life. I replied, I've also been cheated out of money that individuals owe me, but not by someone I considered a friend. I left his residence with the intention of humiliating him. On May 5th, 2009, with around a year less experience than he did, and the same amount of equipment, I launched my own spray foam insulation business. On May 7th, the father calls and inquires about a landscape, acting as if we're on normal terms still. Oh, I don't landscape anymore. I spray foam, I replied. What are you talking about? He queried. He quickly cut off the phone call after I told him that I ran a spray foam insulation business. Then, five minutes later, I get a call from his son, who had been ignoring my calls for weeks, threatening to ruin my chances of succeeding as an insulator, and telling me that no small landscaper could or would succeed in this town. As a side note, the Pacific Northwest currently has about four to five companies providing this kind of service, thanks to my recently established company. The insulation industry is a small one, and information about who does what and so on spreads quickly. Our material supplier, who also happened to be his supplier, gave us our very first project, which was a repair. It seems that the very first project we worked on, that plastic surgeon's house, had poor craftsmanship and quite inadequate insulation. Fortunately, I was only involved with preparation and cleanup at that house. In the end, we had to completely remove and reinstall the insulation from scratch. Regarding a $65,000 job, the homeowner afterwards sued my former boss for it and won. He then failed to communicate effectively, which allowed us to win the government contract at Fort Lewis. Anyway, by treating people better and more honestly, we methodically destroyed his business. Because they had cheated so many people, the story gained traction in the spray foam insulation industry, and we were viewed as something of a hero in this area. Oh, and if you recall, the housing market crashed at that time, and guess who had four very large properties lying on the market that weren't selling? Yes, the father, who ultimately declared bankruptcy by mid-2009. The son, on the other hand, managed to stay afloat for a little while longer. However, a repo man called me in October 2009 and asked if I knew the son and where to find his spray foam equipment. I assigned my father-in-law, a retired police officer and private investigator, to find the necessary equipment. He phoned two days later with the address and precise location of the machinery, which was hidden behind a barn on an island with its tires completely deflated. I phoned the repo man, and two hours later, as he was rolling into the lot with a very huge trailer trailing behind his truck, he called me and asked me where he might send the bounty check. Before being acquired by another business, I ran the insulation business for nearly three years. I continued to own and operate the landscaping businesses as well. Quite a controversial story, but I think they got what they deserved. Good for the OP that he was able to find the strength to start his own company, to become a real competitor to his former company. The main thing is that he didn't just start a company like everyone else. He started a company that was really based on honesty with people. Sometimes I don't really understand the logic of the OP's actions, but I definitely like the goal and the result. I would also like to note that the OP planned his revenge pretty dang well. Not losing his money, but only increasing it. Thank you for watching. Just a reminder, subscribe, like, and comment. See you soon.